you to please turn with me as we continue on in our expository series through the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 4. Um, two things right before I read. Last week our focus was on Daniel's uh, just amazing spirit towards the wicked, towards this wicked king. We saw that last week. I was just struck by that and just can move to to prepare a message in that regard. So that's what I did last time. And I wanted us just to remember that we're reminded of our duty as Christians when dealing with the wicked ones before us, the lost ones, to remember certain things. Number one, we talked about enduring persecution patiently, okay, as Daniel was in the midst of that, um, patiently and faithfully. Number two, remember at one time that you too were foolish. That's a really important point to, to remember. Before you were in Christ, you were just on that other side. That was you. And somebody was gracious towards you by the grace of God. So you always have to remember that. And then number three, reminded to pray for our enemies. And we talked about that last week as well. So I focused in on that. Next time we're going to focus on Nebuchadnezzar, this one man and his humbling and uh, perhaps his conversion. I mean, many think he was converted. We'll talk more about that next time. Um, so, so I'm not going to focus in on that on chapter four. There's so much here in chapter four, man. We're just kind of mining and going through it. Um, <clears throat> but I do hope in this sermon, one thing is, you know, obviously there's all the tension in the air. The election's coming up on Tuesday and we're worried about this and we're worried about that. Swing state here, swing state there. Who's going to win? What's going to happen? Listen, I hope this sermon and you find that thread in this sermon that will give you peace in the midst of that. To understand that God is sovereign in control of all things and, and truly uh just just be encouraged to be who we are in Christ. And we're going to, hopefully that'll come through in the message in some way, perhaps, maybe not, but we'll see. Chapter four, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. And we're going to pick up in 13 and read through 27. This is the word of the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar says, I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. And you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation because all the wise men of the kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is with you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, <clears throat> and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, to Bel said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached to the heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in which the food for all, and which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived, it is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop the tree, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, 
in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation. O king, a decree of the Most High, which has become upon, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you for a time, for the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. The reading of God's word thus far. May God bless the reading of his word to his glory and to our good. Like I said, next time we're going to focus more on Nebuchadnezzar specifically as a person. But today, I want to speak to the bigger picture. More than a king's personal experience with the living God, I want to talk to the uh, speak to the overarching idea of the kingdom of God. And that's really what we have here especially. It runs throughout Daniel. Uh, we saw in, in chapter 2. We'll see it later on as well. But the overarching idea of the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man. The promised king to come, the one who rules and reigns, saves and judges. Uh, like we said, <clears throat> picking up on the promise of chapter 2, if you want to turn back very quickly to, to just a page or two back, just beginning in verse 44. <clears throat> and we read that in these days, Of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, and the clay, and the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. And here, if you've caught it, two times I read, but three times in this section, there's that refrain that says that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will, to the lowliest of men. And that's what I want our focus to be this morning. And again, um, I just want there to be real encouragement for us as Christians and as the, as the church as we move forward. So there's the dream. We read about the dream. We know the tree. And by the way, I think this is, I think I heard it somewhere that Nebuchadnezzar loved trees. He loved the strong trees, the strength, the beauty of those trees. But anyway, uh, this dream, the tree, just that was Nebuchadnezzar and, 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 and his kingdom. And he constructed a magnificent kingdom, a magnificent worldly kingdom. And, and that's that's in play here because it's a kingdom of God against the, the, the versus the kingdom of man, and he ruled and he reigned with pride and, and hubris, arrogance, uh, idolatry, a ruthless heart. That's that's how he ruled over his kingdom. That tree standing tall, proud, strong, flourishing, represented a prideful Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and, and by extension his kingdom. And this is true of all men apart from God, the kings that they try to build from people like Nebuchadnezzar, even to people, individuals who build their own kingdom that's opposed to God in their own hearts and their own lives doing that apart from God. But here we have the quintessential example of man's kingdom and what he can do and what he can accomplish. He thinks apart from God, but it certainly was Babylon was the envy of so many and feared just by, by, by everybody at that time. Well constructed, majestic, beautiful, the hanging gardens, the enormous walls that were built around, the palaces, the temples, Marduk, Ishtar, the gods. I, I, um, to have a couple of slides, I'm, I, just, just so you could see, get a little bit of a visual on this. And this is a reconstruction of Babylon the Great. Look at that. That is really beautiful. That's amazing. That's majestic. That's intimidating. It's fearful. Just the, the hanging gardens, you could see them there. <clears throat> the palaces, the power, 
that he wielded. This is that one man, well constructed and majestic in that way. Do you see that? That's man. Unparalleled in might and strength and power. Babylon the Great, perhaps the greatest of all the ancient kingdoms. Even, even compared to Rome, many still think that Babylon was the kind of the greatest, uh, proto, that, 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 that kingdom that was there. One of the first and greatest, perhaps, of all. Yet, that repeat, repeated refrain that we see offers that, that, at least here, that glimmer of hope that will really blossom. That hope that God has the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will, to the loneliest of man. So that tells us right there, that's a clue for us who believe in the Lord. Because remember, Nebuchadnezzar, yes, he ruled, he reigned, beautiful, but he wasn't a, a benevolent ruler. He was malevolent. He was wicked. He was evil. He was harsh. He was eager. He ruled with an iron fist. People lived under suppression under him. Okay, he had this was man's kingdom built up, but here we have that hope of something better, something deeper, something more profound, and something more lasting. Why? Because it's from God. God said, God said, the Most High rules the kingdoms and gives it to whom He will. It's God's word. It's God's decree. It's God's promise. So it's better than anything man can construct. Man's kingdom. The kingdom's constructed again. It's, and as Christians, we should be able to see this. It's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of man, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. Again, you can't have it both ways. You're going to love one, you're going to hate the other. You're going to follow one, you're going to despise the other. Ultimately, in that way. But man's kingdom, kingdom constructed by him, exalts man. It just does. It's his image. It's his imagination. And listen... Those kingdoms that are built, like Babylon the Great, but even the kingdoms that you construct apart from God are ways of trying to insulate you from holy and righteous God. And the bigger you could build, the more that you have, the more space you think you have be between you and God, the more insulated you feel from having to answer to God. It's kind of the suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. But if I could build this up, if I could do this on my own, and I'm not acknowledging God, what do I need God for, right? I have this. I'm able to do this. I've constructed this. Look at me. And it shows and it demonstrates an independent spirit from God. That's man's sinful spirit. We're just independent from God. We don't need God. Look what I've done. Look what I've constructed. Look who I am. Do you know who I am? No need to honor God. No need to look to God. No need to obey God. No need to reverence God. No need to depend upon God. I will be like God. That's the kingdom of darkness. That's man's kingdom. And that's what we see with Nebuchadnezzar. He's not a servant under God, but lords it over others. He institutes his way, his religion, his laws, his kingdom. Apart from God, that's the kingdom of darkness. But the Lord says, the Most High rules over the kingdom and gives it to the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. We need to come to that realization that he is sovereign God, that he is almighty God, and we need to understand that. Now, not only the man, but soon this kingdom will be cut down to size. The fall of Babylon wasn't too far off. 537, the Medes and the Persians, led by Cyrus, came in and destroyed it. You know what Babylon looks like today? Still pretty majestic ruins, but this is the kingdom of man, and this is what it leads to, and this is what it gets you ultimately. Right? It still looks pretty cool, but not like before. That's ruins. And that's where man's kingdom leads to. It's, it's dust. It doesn't last. It can't save you. It's not going to help you with what you need most of all. That's why he says the most high rules over the kingdom of men gives it to whom he will. And he gives it to the lowliest man. And that is so important for us. And that gives us hope from long ago, way before the time of Christ, just like in chapter two, ultimately it's pointing to Christ. Cause there have been lowly, humble people that have come to power, but none like Jesus Christ. So we have him. Is different with him. Earthly kingdoms rise and fall. His kingdom lasts forever. His is the, his is the eternal kingdom. He rules and reigns over all. God is different. 
it endures. It is like the mustard seed, his kingdom in many ways, and it's growing and going out and continue to do that, and it offers us great hope. But it is the most high, and this is the message, because you don't know how intimidating it could be when you're standing before this man with all this power, all this might, all this influence. You know what it's like just a little bit to be to be in the presence of somebody who has influence, who has stature, who has power. But it's nothing compared to Almighty God. It is God who owns, who rules the kingdom of men. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says this, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The world is the Lord's, for he has made it. And we're told here that he gives it to whom he will. That's important. And listen, it's not this haphazard thing. He's not just saying, well, I think I'll give it to Flex. He doesn't do that. (laughs) This is speaking to his decree. This is speaking to his power, his purpose, his plan for redemption and for his kingdom to flourish. He gives it to whom he will. Who does he give it to? That, again, is important. And you can hearken back to Luke's message to think about this. But Psalm 2, once again, tells us this. So it's God who who rules the kingdom. Psalm 2, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. He is the king that rules and he gives it to his son, Jesus Christ, because there is salvation in no one else. And he's Christ the king. Amen. Praise God. This is it. He gives it to whom he will. And then he says to the lowliest of men. Again, there's some prototypes that we have in scripture. We think of David. He was lowly. He was humble. He was in the field. All the other brothers came before. Oh, you look beautiful. Oh, you're sure. But no, 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 no. Is there anybody else? Oh, there's a little boy out in the field tending the sheep. Bring him. He's the one. See that humility. That's a picture that shows, that foreshadows the, the, the humility of the great king, even Jesus Christ. And then there's even Josiah. Remember young Josiah? Really shaky circumstances with that one. And yet he was preserved by the Lord and then was a wonderful uh, king, as as we saw. But he he reigned and he ruled very well. Uh, his advisor did it first and then eventually he did as well. So we have that. Do you see the, the, the here? But none of this, none of this like none of this is like the promised one our King of kings and our Lord of lords. And that's the hope. And Daniel, it's the hope today. It's the hope that we see in Jeremiah. Who is this lowliest of men? Who is this most humble, most meek of men? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, of course, we're going to turn to this passage when we think of this. Because he says, I will give it to the lowliest of men. Isaiah 53, just the first few verses, says this. I love hearing those pages turn, and I will wait to. <laughs> it's just so old school. Everybody back in the day was all. Choo, choo, choo. Now I know you're sliding along, you know, your phone. That's okay, too. But I still like hearing the pages turn. Isaiah 53, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. And he had no form or majesty that we should look upon him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. The lowliest of men. I'm going to give it to the lowliest of men. Ultimately, that is Christ. And Isaiah speaks to that. We see when we talk about the lowliest of men of Christ, we think of Jesus. He's he's the greatest. He's the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings. But he humbled himself. He put away. He set aside his glory and he took on humanity so he can identify with us. He knows us, as Hebrews tells us. He can sympathize with our weakness. And he's the one who saves us because he does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Only Jesus Christ could live a perfect life. You can't. Only Christ could righteously pay for that and make atonement for it. You can't. But he's the lowliest of men. And that's spoken of in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who although... He was in the form of God, didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But what did he do? He emptied himself 
by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see that? That's Christ, the lowliest of men. In Luke chapter 2, I am going to turn to Luke, and you may join me if you like. Luke 2, we see the announcements of the angel. Just just understand, even back in the Daniel context, the contrast. Here's Nebuchadnezzar, and here's Babylon, and here's that kingdom ruling over, so powerful, so influential, so prominent. But yet, this little one, there's going to be, I'm, I'm appointing one. The, the lowly, the most humble. And he says this in Luke chapter 2. You know this all too well. You're going to hear this again in another month as we come into Advent. Beginning in uh, verse 8. In that same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people, all the nations, everywhere. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, the lowliest of men. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel, and so now you have the great humility, but you have the exaltation too. There was an angel with a great multitude of heavenly hosts praying God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. See? The kingdom is Christ. He pronounces it himself. Remember in Mark chapter 1. Mark 1, we read this. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of Christ, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. This is when the light comes in. Here comes the kingdom. And that darkness is overtaken. Not like before, but here it is now. Again, refer to Luke's sermon on this. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is is at hand. The kingdom of God. Repent and believe in the gospel. The lowliest. That just speaks to Christ's humiliation. His birth, his life, lived the way he lived, his death on the cross. But then we have the exaltation, his resurrection, his ascension to the lowliest, which has actually always been the greatest. But you see that in the in his resurrection, in the ascension, and as the kingdom is given to him. And so what we're talking about, we talk about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man. Start thinking like that. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light, Christ ruling and reigning. Doesn't matter who's in power, doesn't matter what else is going on. Jesus Christ is king. And we proclaim that because people need to know that and they need him. Amen? You're going to see that a little bit more here as we go go through this. So the lowliest to the highest. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Again, you know this very well. After the resurrection, before the ascension, Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of who? All nations. My kingdom is going to all nations. That gospel is going out everywhere. So you make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that which I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you even to the end of the age. This is the hope of the nations. Jesus Christ is. Not simply because he's king and reigning, because he's Savior and Lord. There's no other way of salvation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's the message you've received. That's the message we have. That's the truth that we know. And live accordingly to it. That's Christianity, man. That's what it is. That's what we're called to. And you know what? As that gospel goes out, as the kingdom comes forth, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It can't. That it's not. They're not. They, they can't. Go. It's offensive. We're going out with the gospel, and it's not going to be stopped. And you see that in history. This isn't pie in the sky. This is truth. Just think on history. This means when we think about this kingdom, what he's talking about here in Daniel, the promise that we have, fullness seen in Jesus Christ. It means kingdom of this world. 
can withstand the onslaught of the gospel. Do you realize that? Wherever the gospel goes, it prevails. It does, it does. So many lives are changed. Well, you might not say, well, not the whole population. I mean, it's going to upset you a little bit if you're post-mill, maybe. But, you know, that wherever it goes, lives are transformed. Lives are changed. Lives are affected. People are brought in to the kingdom. So many. False gods are put away. We're not going to worship that way anymore. We're not going to live that way anymore. I have a savior. I have a King Jesus and I'm living for him now. So I'm putting my idols away. Darkness is held at bay. We live for the true God. We worship His name is exalted among us as his people. And that's the message we bring to the nations. And when that goes, it can. Why? Those strongholds of evil. That light pierces the darkness and societies are always impacted for the better when true Christianity takes hold. That's it. That's that's Christianity. That's what it's here for. His law reigns, even if you don't acknowledge him. He's still right. You're wrong. That's all. We were all wrong at one time, right? Capiche? That's it. Now he's, it's his kingdom. For the nations contain every single nation, every tribe, tongue. When he says disciple the nations, every nation, every place, every area in this world contain God's elect people. Do you understand that? You, in this, that we were part, we were called before the foundation of the world. When the gospel came to us, We were destined to hear that gospel. So when we go out to the nations, God has his elect there. And as the gospels preached, they are destined to hear that gospel and understand it and become be driven to repentance, belief, receiving, resting on Christ as he's offered in the gospel. That's what it is. That's why we go and it can't be stopped. And as the Lord transforms us, we conform to his word wherever we are. We boldly, clearly preach the gospel of Christ and the kingdom. That's what we do. That's When we talk about making disciples, the first thing, you can't have disciples if they're not truly converted. If that, you're just going to raise legalistic people or people under, you know, under the sword, kind of forced upon them. No, it begins with the gospel. It begins with the change of heart that only the Holy Spirit makes. And then we teach them. And we proclaim the kingdom. Now, in addition to that, as Christians, wherever we find ourselves, and this is important to get, and I think we have forgotten this in the last 40 or 50 years at least, we humbly yet boldly live as citizens of the kingdom. Wherever we find ourselves, we belong to him. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. What do ambassadors do? They represent their their president. They represent their king. And we speak what he speaks. We say what he says. We teach what he teaches. That's what we do as ambassadors of Christ. We're representing him. We don't mix the message, turn the message, come up with a new message. We bring his message to the nations. We bring it, starting with the gospel, but also with his standards, man. Yeah, that's true. There's still an ultimate standard. People still need to be subject to that. Right? And, and, And hopefully that's one way of driving them to Christ if they're not in Christ. But that standard stands. Just because you don't believe doesn't mean you can live any way you want. Right? No, there's a standard there. You're going to live any way you want, but you're going to give an answer to that. Does that make... Right? That's what's going on. That's The the kingdom is advancing in that way. So we live as sojourners. But even as sojourners, as citizens of the kingdom, we hold out the expectations and the standard of the king to all people. Begin with the gospel, but we hold out that standard too. What do you think John the Baptist was doing when he talked to to Herod? He was bringing the kingdom standard to Herod. Herod wasn't a... He had nothing to do with Christ. You have your brother's wife. See, the standard of the kingdom, that's adultery. You can't do that. I don't have to believe. I don't even believe in your God. You are under God. You cannot do that. Jesus to the woman at the well at Samaria. It, I'm, I'm a Samaritan. I'm not even a Jew. What, what's it matter if I have five husbands and the one I'm with now is not even my husband? What's it matter? It matters because those are the kingdom precepts. And they still apply to you even if you don't want them to. <laughs> even if you don't think they should, they still do. So that's why he said that to her. Go get your husband. Right? Adultery, you can't have that. 
Turn with me to Acts chapter 14. And I think this is a... Last time we'll be turning in Scripture, but I, I want to see this uh, uh, another by, by illustration uh, from Scripture. And I'm not stretching this. I want to make this connection, again, to the kingdom of God as it advances, as it goes through, with the gospel and with the king's standards. So what's, what we do? So in Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are at Lystra, and they they healed a man, and the people were amazed that they were able to heal them. Well, obviously, wow, look at this. So what did the people do there? They started treating Paul and Barnabas as if they were gods. Okay. And it says this. At Lystra, there was a man sitting. You know what? Let me begin in uh, verse 8. Yeah. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and never, ever walked. I added that ever. Uh, he listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. He sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted their voices saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. See, that's the darkness. That's the kingdom of darkness speaking. Ah, these men are gods, right? That's, that's, they're, they're here among us. They're, they're, they need to be reverenced and put on a higher plane than regular men and people. That's darkness. That's what we do here. And so many people in darkness want to do that. They want to be elevated up, you know, beyond the, the general population. Wow, look at that person. Oh, isn't she amazing? Isn't he amazing? That that kind of thing. So so they're exalting them. And here's what the people are thinking in a very uh, darkness kingdom way, this worldly way. And then he says, Barnabas, um, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priests of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate. They wanted to offer sacrifice to the crowds. Okay, so in the kingdom of darkness, a lot of people will accept that. They'll accept, uh, Nebuchadnezzar would have accepted that. You know, okay, that's right. You can pay homage to me and you know show this loyalty, whatever, to me. But what's the kingdom of light say? What's the kingdom of Christ say? But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard it, they tore their garments. They tore their garments. They rushed into the crowd and they cried out, Men, what are you doing? Why are you doing these things? What's wrong with you? What? We are also men of like nature with you. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. That's the kingdom coming in. Don't do this anymore. Here's the truth. Here's the, Christ is the truth. He's the one who needs to be worshipped and served. We are also of nature like you. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to the living God. And now listen to this. The living God who made the heavens and the earth, the sea that's all that's in them, verse of Psalm 24, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Do you see that? In past times, in those dark times, before Christ, there was that darkness. There was always some light, because even then it goes on to say, but he made himself known through what he did for you. So there's always a witness. But generally, at that time before Christ, that was the dark, that was the kingdom there of darkness. Now the kingdom of light has come. You put off that. You don't live like that. This is the way. This is what you need to understand. The kingdom is here. Christ is here. And we're to live for him. Do not worship false God. God has more fully revealed himself and his kingdom in Christ. You see? It goes right back to what he says in Daniel. That he rules over, that he reigns, and he's going to put that hope is finding its fruition, finding its fullness in Christ. It continues to do so even until he comes back. If the Lord is then pleased to build a consensus and we're able to implement righteous standards, amen, praise God. If not, we, like Daniel, remain faithful to our calling in the gospel without compromise. Do you understand that? That's very important. So, in his providence, we may be very received very well and the message takes root and you know you see a change in lives and in homes and even even in, in even in society and that's that's happened even in this nation for for a time but he may very well be pleased not to in which case we endure persecution because we're still going to be faithful but it's not going to be we're not going to be accepted and it's his rule and reign, his ways aren't necessarily going to take. And so we're going to have to put up with a lot. You understand? 
And so you need to be willing and ready to face persecution with grace, like we talked about last week, patiently. That's how it is. Think of North and South Korea. They're Christians. They're the elect. There's a church in North Korea, but they're persecuted and they're under pressure and they're losing their homes, their jobs, in many cases their lives, but they're persevering with patience. They're not implementing the the law of God or, or, the, or the rules of God as you, as you would like to take hold in, in a nation, but they're being faithful. Go a few miles away to South Korea. Lots of Christians there. Lots of freedom there, by and large. And you see more, more freedom. And you see more of Christ's righteousness in that society. See, and that's, that's what it is. That's what, that's what it, God's reigning. That darkness is being pushed out by the light. You think of history. As the kingdom advances, as the gospel takes hold, you'll see society is shaped by and large, not completely, and I would say not till the Lord returns, by and large, shaped by Scripture, by God's law, by His principles, and by His precepts. We're a really good example of that in this nation. When it is shaped by God's laws, principles, and precepts, we have a beautiful um, glimpse, foretaste of His kingdom to come. It mirrors not man's kingdom, but Christ's kingdom, God's kingdom. And the fullness awaits. And I would say fullness awaits at his return. I would have post mill friends to say maybe just before he returns, and that's fine. But we know that light overcomes the darkness. His kingdom come, his will will be done. Now, I'm just going to leave you with a contrast because there's very practical implications, and I hope this helps us a little bit because it's not just ethereal, oh, we're just talking about the kingdom here, kingdom there. What's a very, very practical application. Again, where the gospel is preached, where the Christians are living faithfully, and God is pleased to allow it to take root in that nation, you could see very clearly the contrast between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God on a practical level. It impacts everyday life. It impacts every sphere of life, whether it's the family, whether it's whether it's the church, whether it's education, whether it's work, whether it's health care. Every single sphere in life is impacted by the kingdom of God in that way. And where does that light, where it takes hold? I'm just going to give one example and we'll end with this. Just think of the justice system where you have... Well, the gospel is preached and it takes hold. And there's a nation or a consensus committed to righteousness. I mean righteousness, not the twisted kinds of expressions of Christianity that you may get in certain time er, time and place, but I'm talking true, authentic Christianity, those who love the Lord and seek to serve Him and honor Him. Just think of the justice system under the realm of God. And not perfectly, because there's always going to be sinners, there's always going to be things wrong, but by and large, primarily, and this is the goal, in the kingdom of light, to those who love Christ, there is truly a justice based on God's word. What God says is just. Not what man thinks is just, injustice, but what God says is just. That's what rules, that's what guides, that's what informs us. So there's a concern for law and order and protection because that's what justice is all about. Just laws that protect the innocent. You want to be protected if you're innocent. You don't want to be falsely charged with something you didn't do. Oh, you stole this. I'm making this charge up and now you're... What? I didn't do that. So laws that protects the innocent and that are for the good of society. Not all society is going to like some of the laws, some of the vice laws. You're not going to like them. Because they go against your sinful nature, but they are there to protect you. Just like a parent, you make rules to protect your kids. We're going to put up that fence. You can't go out on that street because you might get hit by a car. Do you understand? They might not like that. They want to run and go, but you say no. Laws that deter crime, that enforce, that are enforced to curb evil, that punish the guilty justly, rightly and swiftly. And it's based on God's word and God's kingdom. So if somebody, you have a business and somebody comes in and steals your merchandise, 
right in front of you is walking out the door. That's stealing. That's a sin. And that's a crime. And that's wrong. Because it's God who puts that down. And you know in your heart at some point it's wrong. But some people say, no, no, that's right. I'm owed this. This is mine. I've been ripped off for all these years. I could take what I want. That's not true. It doesn't belong to you. You haven't earned it. You can't purchase it. Do you understand? We long for this. We long for that. It's, it's, it's wrong. When the kingdom takes root and the kingdom principles come to bear, truth will be preserved. Truth will be pursued. And you're going to be fair. There will be equal weights and measures. It's not just because this group is in power now or this group is in power at this time because we're going to make it unequal at that time to serve us apart from God. But when God's involved, we don't play favorites. We don't do that. We're not partial. We're not going to put a little bit more favor at this, this end and not on that end. That's the kingdom of God coming before you. Do you understand that? And for so many years, we've taken that for granted in this nation because we have been founded on Christian principles. And much of this ideology and theology has been brought forth. So we just take it for granted. Now in the day that we're living in, we're seeing this is what's happening here. Don't be surprised at what's happening here when you turn away from the Lord. This is what happens everywhere where darkness reigns. We want civil servants at every level, from dog catcher to president of the United States, civil servants on every level to serve with integrity, man, to serve with honesty, without bias. Those who will not abuse their authority or use their position to gain advantage. Who see themselves, by and large, for what they are, and they are ministers of God. Now, they don't have to admit that. They don't have to say that. They don't even have to believe that. But that's exactly what they are. Paul tells us very clearly in Romans 13. Check it out. Do we have that? Well, then I'll just turn there. I thought I had that one down. In Romans chapter 13, very clearly, you. I'm just turning there. You may turn verse 1 and verse 4. Romans 13. We're told this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Do you see that? And then down in verse 4, he says, for he's speaking of the civil servants, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he doesn't bear the sword in vain, for he's a servant of God, the avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. See, that's that's what government is. That's what it should be. That's a justice system. Now we've turned that around, we've wiped warping that. We're we're not we don't do that. There's too much darkness. Servants under God and not lords over the people. This is just one little example. When we talk about the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. This is what I'm pointing to. Find those people that you are under the authority obligated to rule and reign and to administer the justice as he prescribes. And when you go against that, then you're wrong. You're wrong because you're going against God who instituted that government. Because you'll use that for your own power, for your own sake, for your own group. Servants of God. The heart is too deceitful. That's why we wanted checks and balances. Nations where there's little light or where the light approaches or where the Nebuchadnezzar. Just a matter of degree. Authority he's going to exert. Nebuchadnezzar had a lot of that. But whatever power they'll do. And here's what that does. Here's what the kingdom of darkness looks like when it comes to justice. They'll pursue power, authority, and control. Corruption, fraud, and conflict are marked by it. Personal and corporate vendettas. When I'm in power, the people that were against me are going to pay the price. You're going to go to jail, or you're going to you're going to pay the fine. We're going to come down hard on you. See, it's not equal weights and measures. It's just not partiality. It's not if this person gets it off, then everything's going to be fair and right. Laws, standards become subjective. Unjust laws, bribes, coercion. Laws are passed that penalize the innocent and reward the guilty. We could think of abortion right now. You're, you're penalizing the, 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 the righteous and awarding the guilty. Righteous laws are not enforced. And we're not going to enforce those laws anymore. The, you could take up to $2,000 or $200 and just steal it from somebody. That's okay. 
broken, non-existent justice system filled with corruption, that leaves no confidence, little protection. People that are frightened, vulnerable, and oppressed, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. When, when the darkness comes in to those areas of leadership, you're going to see the slightest crime is going to be penalized to the fullest extent of the law, and these crimes that need to be really per- prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, they kind of go free. Oh, you murdered this person, you did this, you're from another country or illegally, you can go out on the streets. That's not biblical, it's not right. That's darkness. The one promotes, protects, and preserves life truly seeks to be equitable and fair according to God's word. There's order, there's structure, there's decorum, there's safety, there's justice, there's respect, honor, integrity, honesty, trustworthiness, freedom, opportunity. It exhibits grace, compassion, and mercy. It seeks truth. That's when the kingdom takes root. That's when the gospel has a foothold. That's when the light shines. It's not by chance that that happens. Because left to man himself, we're going to all be like Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to tend towards that, right? Absolutely. Because that's our heart. But when that changes, you have life. The other side creates strife, insecurity, suffering, inequality, partiality, disorder, Chaos, impropriety. When I mean by impropriety, that's a failure to observe standards or to show due honor or honesty or modesty in behavior and character. There's no decorum. It leaves people uninspired, suspicious, and frightened. The very ones that you are called to serve, to protect, to promote life, to be fair with, to be honest with, now are being ruled over by you unjustly and unfairly. See, that's the darkness moving in. That's just one example. It's very practical when we talked about the kingdom of light. And even if not everybody's converted there, the the word of God, the law of God still applies. So, when the kingdom takes hold, the gospel is proclaimed, hearts are changed, societies are transformed. One day, and we've we've lived a residual of that. Now, it looks like we're coming to an end of that. One day we'll see the fullness of the kingdom. But until then, we need to live faithfully, truly and honestly, and knowing that the battle belongs to the world, um, to, to the world, to the Lord, no matter what the circumstance.